Hi everyone, my name is Cheryl Cohen. I'm with Arthritis Consumer Experts and it is both uh, my privilege and my honor uh, to be here uh, today uh, with Dr. Michelle Petrie, uh, who is a legend um, in the field of rheumatology and, uh, and I'll tell you a little bit about her um, before you meet her. Um, Dr. Petrie is a professor of medicine at the Johns Hopkins University School of Medicine. Uh, she attended medical school at Harvard University and fulfilled her internal medicine residency at the Massachusetts General Hospital, otherwise affectionately known as the Mass. In addition, she completed two fellowship programs at the University of California, San Francisco in allergy and immunology and rheumatology. Dr. Petrie is the director of the Hopkins Lupus Cohort, a longitudinal study of morbidity and mortality in systemic lupus erythematosus and is the co-director of the Hopkins Lupus Pregnancy Center. So Dr. Petrie, with that uh, very abbreviated bio, uh, welcome to the, to the program. We're really honored to have you. Thank you. Yeah. When you said I was a legend, it made me feel very old. Oh, come on. You're my contemporary, so we can be old together. How's that? <laughs> Um, we know that you, tomorrow actually, you're giving your talk at the Canadian Rheumatology Association and Arthritis Health Professions Association um, pre-course, uh, as they affectionately call it, um, and that's for residents. And you're going to be talking on something I know you're very expert on, um, antiphospholipids, uh, who to treat and when. Um, so for our audience, uh, Dr. Petrie, which is largely a patient audience, we have a number of members uh, who have lupus. Um, this is being broadcast as part of our hashtag Sea Arthritis event that we are entering our seventh year in. Um, and we really wanted to have a, a chat with you uh, to learn more about what's happening um, in your field. And we'd like you to start off by telling us how you got into rheumatology. What is it about rheumatology back when you were doing your training um, that, that lured you in? Oh, I think it was actually meeting patients because when I was a medical student, we had a pathophysiology course and the rheumatologists at Mass General brought their patients in. They were on a stage in the auditorium and these patients were mostly young women. Yeah. So as a young woman in the audience, I, of course, identified with the young women with these chronic rheumatologic diagnoses. And it changed my mind because I actually had seriously considered psychiatry. And, uh, and I thought, no, this is it. This is what Isn't I want to amazing? do. I want to help these young women. Yeah. You know, um, others uh, that we know and are on our advisory board have talked about um, lupus and, and, and how much the treatment has changed and how the prognosis in, in lupus has changed over the years. Um, and I, one, one uh, rheumatologist I know used to talk about how the hallways, you know, they, they would put the occasional photo of a baby up. And now today, because of the advances of science, women who have lupus ha can successfully, uh, you know, um, give birth and raise their children. Whereas in the past, probably when you started, that wasn't necessarily the case. Well, in fact, it was a shock to me when I got to Hopkins 35 years ago, because when I trained in San Francisco as a fellow, our lupus patients were allowed to get pregnant. And at Hopkins, the patients had been taught that pregnancy was too dangerous. Right. So if someone became pregnant, they had a termination. So the very first patient I had who was pregnant, she said to me, oh, I'm pregnant. And I said, congratulations. And she burst into tears. And I thought, what have I done? And she told me, well, I'm going to have to have a termination. I said, well, that's not how I was trained. And so that's why I started the Lupus Pregnancy Center. Yeah. Because I was bound and determined that we were not only going to allow pregnancies, but we were going to do everything possible to make sure they were successful. Yeah. And so we're now up to, I don't know, 700 successful pregnancies and counting. That's but you always have to start with one. Yeah. And, and by the way, that particular patient, I must have cared for her for 20 more years after the pregnancy. And those weren't easy years. She had yeah. terrible peripheral vascular disease. 
she had a leg amputation. But you know, we always start out every visit by talking about her daughter. Isn't that lovely? That successful pregnancy. Yeah. Because that was the joy of her life. Yeah. And you don't want to take away the possibility of pregnancy. Yeah, yeah. But on the other hand, we don't want to hide the fact that in lupus, pregnancies are high risk. Yeah, they are. Um, you know, we're, we're going to give our audience a little sneak peek. We're going to get the information out from you now, but it will probably air after you give your talk um, tomorrow at the residence pre-course. But give us a little snapshot of the talk, if, if you would, Dr. Petrie, uh, antiphospholipids, who to treat and when. Antiphospholipid antibodies are common in lupus, but not every patient who has an antiphospholipid antibody is going to have either a clotting event or a pregnancy loss. Right. We're getting much better at predicting who's at high risk of having a clotting event. We know that the one autoantibody that's most important is the lupus anticoagulant, but it doesn't act alone. And so other things that happen in the person with lupus, such as low complement and platelets activated by complement split products combine to create a high risk situation. And this is now called immunothrombosis to show that the immune system and the thrombosis pathways are interknit at several different stages. And it's so important that it's become part of COVID because in COVID there are antiphospholipid antibodies and there are clots in the lung. And in COVID it's thought to be immunothrombosis. So I thought it's fascinating that things that we learn in lupus are gonna turn out to be important as we finally better understand COVID. Yeah, it's amazing how, uh, how much the inflammatory arthritis uh, that, that our treatment armamentarium has been looked into. You know, it's like they're looking into our doctor's bag saying, well, what can we use in here for this inflammatory um, respiratory, respiratory um, disease? And they've tried pretty much everything that's being used currently in certainly the disease area that I live with, which is rheumatoid arthritis. I, every day mm -hmm. I open up my news feed and I say, oh, they're trying this one and that one. And yes. uh, it's really- Yes, but somewhat, just somewhat ironic that yeah. dexamethasone, uh, the old steroids that we want to get rid of in rheumatology have turned out to be life-saving yeah. for people with COVID pneumonia. Yeah, no, incredible. Um, Let's turn to your role as director uh, at the Hopkins Lupus Center, if we could, Dr. Petrie. And can you share with us sort of any updates on guidelines, treatment uh, models um, of care for lupus, things like that? Our membership, our viewers, the people that come to us through our social media are always looking for kind of the, the latest and greatest. Um, you, I, mean, you I think there have been some, some breakthroughs yeah. in lupus. This has been the most exciting year ever because mm -hmm. of two new treatments for lupus nephritis. One is a next generation calcineurin inhibitor and the other is our one and only approved biologic for lupus, belimumab, which just got approved for lupus nephritis. So I think that's going to be yeah. uh, exciting to have more in our toolbox. But in addition, this is the year where the Accelerated Medicines Partnership or AMP is coming to fruition. So that's the study of single cell RNA sequencing on kidney biopsies. Wow. And that's going to give us so much more information. And is that part of the longitudinal work that you're doing there? We're helping, but that's a multi-center study. Okay. So our, our group is in charge of the urine proteome group and in particular Andrea Fava, one of our junior faculty has found that interleukin-16 in the urine may be a very good marker oh. of uh, active kidney disease, okay. even before the person has proteinuria. Yeah. But in non-renal lupus, the breakthrough was really in 2019, and it, it came from David Pazetsky's group because they're the ones that divided non-renal lupus symptoms into type 1 that are due to inflammation, like skin and rash, yeah. versus type 2, which are not due to inflammation, but terribly bother our patients. And those are the things like chronic fatigue, chronic pain, brain fog, headaches, insomnia, anxiety. 
And I thought that was so important. Yeah. Because I, I need to have a way to frame this so that my patients understand what are we going to chase with lupus treatments and what things the type two symptoms are going to require a different approach. Yeah. Yeah. You know, from a patient perspective, I, I can speak with some authority from not, not from a lupus perspective, but from RA. When, when a person better understands what they have and that you can actually drill down a bit and, and now there's categorization, you feel there's a validation that happens and someone can sort of look at a label and go, okay, well, that's what I have. And we often find, Dr. Petrie, that people then are more curious about what kind of therapy might be recommended they may be more willing to sort of, I don't want to say buy in, but I don't have a better phrase for it, but believe in perhaps your yes. prescription, your prognosis, and then you start working perhaps better as a, as a team, or, or am I kind exactly. of making that up in my head? Because I'm afraid what was happening before is we would just say, well, the fatigue isn't from active lupus, and I think that led to anger. Yeah. Was we were saying that what was happening to that person couldn't be real. Yeah. We said it wasn't due to active lupus. Yeah. And now I think because of David Bezeski, we have a much better framework to explain that, of course, it's happening to that person. And of course, it's real. But because it's from neurologic pathways as opposed to inflammatory pathways, we need to have a different approach. Absolutely. Um, you know, at the patient level, we're always looking for things that we can control. You know, a lot of times we can't control what's happening with our disease, even if we're on um, a you know good medication plan, a good diet plan, or whatever. But our our members are often looking for lifestyle tips. I think I would call them. You know, what what is it, Doctor Petrie, that I can do in my own home, on my own time, during my day, that you feel as a clinician and as a cl clinician scientist. Did actually work? Things that I can do for myself? Well, I, I look at it perhaps in two different ways. One is uh, medicines don't work if people don't take them. Right. So I, I think adherence is so important. And, you know, I had to figure that out, you know, a, a tough way by actually measuring blood levels that 50% of my own patients weren't taking hydroxychloroquine regularly. Oh. And so it led to an opportunity that at the next visit, I could discuss why I wanted the person to take hydroxychloroquine regularly, right. that its major role was preventive. Because even if the person was feeling okay, I still wanted to improve survival, prevent atherosclerosis, prevent thrombosis. Yeah. But a whole second approach is to remember that most people with lupus don't die from lupus the major cause of death is atherosclerosis, cardiovascular right. and cerebrovascular events like heart attacks and strokes. So everybody with lupus should have a heart healthy lifestyle. And the pushback I get is I'm too busy. Yeah. I don't have time. I'm too tired. Yeah. And so it's, it's my job to you know, give that little push, say you're the most important person your family can't do without you. You matter for you. Take this time because the time we invest in our cardiovascular fitness is going to pay off for decades to come. And by the way, during this pandemic, helps with the stress. Yeah. It, you know, we've had a couple, we've had actually a number of experts in our studio having conversations with us about what's happening during COVID on top of the different types of autoimmune mm -hmm. uh, disease that we're living with and have had strategies that are rooted both in, you know, let's say traditional medical practice, but also things like yoga and, you know, relaxation. We've had someone talk to us about transcendental meditation, um, all kinds of kind of, di di I, I wouldn't, don't want to say different because they're, they're, those are commonly used, but perhaps people with arthritis thinking about them in a different way um, during, you know, something as horrific as a pandemic. Well, I think we all have to be honest about the terrible effect of social isolation. Yeah. 
is having on all of us. Yeah. But of course, an added burden for all those suffering with chronic diseases. Yeah, yeah. Um, Dr. Petrie, you are a wealth of information. I know I could keep you for hours and hours and hours and not even scratch the surface of, of, of your expertise. We're so thankful that you joined us today. Um, we just obviously wish you the very best of luck in your research uh, pursuits, uh, because when you win, we as patients win. Um, we're a team. Yeah, we're, we're a team. team. We're a team. So just want to thank you so much and wish you uh, the best of luck tomorrow during your talk and throughout the Canadian Rheumatology Association and Arthritis Health Professions Association annual scientific meeting. Thank you. Thank you.